Democratic candidate Andrew Yang has spoken favorably about nuclear power and specifically thorium reactors. We are working on these new generation nuclear reactors that use thorium instead of uranium. Nuclear power, in particular thorium reactors, need to be a big part of the energy puzzle moving forward. Nuclear gets a bad rap in part because the technologies we're using are antiquated. The most popular technical response is by David Grossman for Popular Mechanics. Popular Mechanics correctly states that thorium dioxide has a very high melting point, making it more challenging to produce high-quality thorium solid fuel. Popular Mechanics also notes that Yang pledges some portion of $50 billion in R&D specifically towards thorium molten salt reactors. What the article fails to do is connect the dots on what is a thorium reactor and what is a thorium molten salt reactor. On stage, Yang uses the term thorium reactor, thorium reactor. In policy paper, the more specific term thorium molten salt reactor is used. To thorium advocates such as myself, they mean the same thing. The thorium reactor proposed by Yang has no solid fuel, so any fuel fabrication challenge is irrelevant to Yang's proposal. Of course, for India, thorium is important because we don't have too much of uranium. India has been pursuing a solid fuel-based thorium breeder since 1950. One of the former directors of the Indian nuclear program, when asked, if you had it all to do again, what would you differently? He said, I would have gone to molten salt right from the beginning. Dr. Sinha and his colleagues think that the molten salt breeder reactor seems to be the most suitable candidate for the self-sustainable thorium reactor. In fact, many thorium advocates believe that solid fuel reactors make the efficient use of thorium impossible. Thorium molten salt reactors are a type of reactor where thorium is dissolved into salt and converted into uranium-233. It is this uranium-233 which sustains fission, the splitting of atoms to liberate enormous amounts of energy without any combustion at all. Carbon-free, pollution-free energy. But Popular Mechanics says this, while thorium might avoid some of the long-term challenges in waste management, combining it with uranium-233 in the short term would actually be more radioactive than current plants. In a solid fuel reactor, uranium and thorium would be mixed. But in a thorium molten salt reactor, there's actually two distinct salt fluids inside the reactor. The salt containing thorium is there to absorb neutron radiation. And the blanket fluid surrounds the entire core of the reactor. That blanket protects from neutron flux. This neutron radiation hits the thorium in the blanket and converts it to uranium-233. And what's possible with liquid fuel, but not solid fuel, is this. It's going to absorb a neutron, and it's going to begin the process of becoming uranium-233. Now, as it takes those steps, we can employ a chemical separation to remove those new materials from the blanket, and then introduce them into the salt that is going to go in the reactor core. The outer protective blanket of molten salt is continually purified so that only thorium remains in it. Similarly, the uranium-containing salt which sustains fission in the core can also be chemically separated because it's also a liquid. But this time, it is chemically separated to remove fission products. Fission products are created when big atoms split up into little atoms and release energy. The little atoms are called fission products. Both of these chemical extractions, intended to keep only thorium in the blanket salt and the fissioning uranium in the core salt, will be performed on extremely radioactive molten salts. Like most industrial processes using hazardous materials, this chemistry isn't performed by a chemist wearing a lab coat. Humans are kept at a distance from an automated process. But with this level of radiation, electronics must be kept at a distance. Yet. The molten salt reactor experiment, which ran very successfully from 1965 to 69, faced some of these same challenges. On a very tight budget, humans maintained an operating molten salt reactor using nothing more than fiber optic scopes and long handled tools. With the thorium cycle, you could potentially get down to one and a half percent of the long lived waste production of the, of the uranium cycle, and that's a big advantage. So thorium absorbing the neutron, 90% of the time will be fissioned by the next neutron. Think of these as like off-ramps off the freeway. 90% of the cars exit the freeway on the first off-ramp, and 85% of the cars that are left over exit the freeway on the next off-ramp. Uh, how many are there to make your first trains uranium? Only 1.5%. When we first load nuclear fuel in a uranium-fueled reactor, it is entirely uranium, and most of that is uranium-238. Unlike conventional reactors which give us no control over the evolving chemistry inside fuel rods, we can avoid the creation of certain materials 
by removing their precursors. And we can even harvest certain materials being created inside the reactor just because they're particularly valuable. And this is why Andrew Yang saying, It's much, much safer to dispose of, it produces much more energy, sort of nails the idea behind thorium reactors. A gram of natural thorium and a gram of natural uranium contain the same amazing quantity of nuclear energy, just waiting to be liberated. But conventional reactors only liberate a tiny fraction of uranium's potential. The hatch at the bottom gives away the fact that most of the rod is still uranium-238. In fact, the only fraction that has been truly exploited is the fraction you see kind of in those light pastel colors. Those are the fission products. Most of what's in so-called nuclear waste is just natural uranium. It's mixed with all sorts of radioactive fission products and very hard to do anything with. We put spent fuel rods in pools to keep them cool. Then we put them in dry storage casks next to our reactors, basically in parking lots. I consider dry casks containing spent nuclear fuel to be harmless, and my only frustration with so-called nuclear waste is that there's very useful material trapped in it. It is waste because we are wasting it. By extracting the first four fission products, xenon, neodymium, zirconium, and molybdenum, right away you've reduced the waste stream considerably. We don't leave fission products and spent fuel rods only because the fuel rods are solid and difficult to chemically separate. We also don't extract them because the spent fuel rods contain plutonium. Plutonium is a natural part of the uranium fuel cycle. Radiation from the fission products is considered a way of keeping the uranium fuel cycle from causing plutonium weapons proliferation. In contrast, no material emerging from the thorium reactor can be used to make a nuclear weapon. There's no plutonium to protect. What is consumed is thorium. What is produced are fission products. Popular Mechanics argues that the so-called waste from a thorium reactor is more radioactive in the short term. And that's exactly why thorium advocates feel the output from a thorium reactor is preferable over the output from conventional reactors. How radioactive something is, and how long it stays radioactive, are inversely proportional. Some of these radioactive materials are clean energy solutions all by themselves. No need for a nuclear reactor of any kind, a hundred years of power, no refueling required. The thorium reactor produces stuff that is concentrated, segregated, and useful. In contrast, conventional reactors produce stuff that is relatively dilute, mixed, and short-term useless. If you want even more useless and dilute waste, that's coal. All the ash that builds up from the burning of coal, they put it in a big pile. It's called a tailings pile. Well, no break this week for crews in Tennessee trying to clean up that mess of toxic sludge that oozed across hundreds of acres of land just west of Knoxville. Sludge inundated a neighborhood near Harriman, Tennessee. 5.4 million cubic yards. Coal ash residue that comes from burning coal to create electricity at the power plant. That ash is now entered into the neighborhood, entered into the land, and most most importantly, into two rivers here in the Tennessee River watershed, lead, mercury, cadmium, and arsenic. You can see the ash four years later, still working on it. It absorbs a lot of moisture. When we had that big rainstorm, the piles just collapsed and flowed downhill. Pretty much every coal plant has a huge ash tailings pile. This is not unique. They've all got them. This is the waste of coal. Coal already exposes people to more radiation than conventional nuclear power, and that's precisely because it's so dilute. Dilute waste is usually pollution, because we can't hold it in containers. So this one probably a bit small, but it's about a ton of CO2 every five seconds. If coal pollution was concentrated enough, maybe people could fit it in dry casks and store it in a parking lot. The point is, chemically segregated fission products and abundant clean energy will launch new industries and create jobs. I am ecstatic that in 2020 there are Democratic candidates who get nuclear power. Cory Booker and Andrew Yang both support advanced nuclear, and they're pointing out that the majority of carbon-free electricity produced in the United States comes from nuclear simply needs to be said again and again. Trying to get rid of all the nuclear power plants that produce 20% uh, of the nation's energy is not going to help us accomplish our goals. Right now, nuclear is more than 50% of our non-carbon-causing uh, uh, energy. Most Americans don't realize that. 
They really don't, and I was one of them. IPCC puts nuclear's carbon life cycle roughly on par with wind and much lower than solar. Most people don't know that. Learning that one fact can change a person's opinion of nuclear power. Yang's platform explains that nuclear is order of magnitude safer than fossil fuels, and it pledges to engage in a public relations campaign to update the reputation of nuclear reactors. People who think that we can get there without nuclear being part of the blend just aren't looking at the facts. Every Democratic candidate who claims to believe in science ought to be saying the same thing.